Welcome to the Friday Spiritual Checkup for June the 26th. And welcome to What is a Baptist Part 2? This is especially crafted for members of Bonavista Baptist Church. But uh, welcome to all those that are checking in for this time. Well, as we look at the history of Baptists, historically people trace Baptist roots back to around 1609 in Amsterdam. Uh, which is kind of surprising, but there was a, an English separatist congregation in Amsterdam led by a man by the name of John Smith. And that congregation eventually made its way back to England and came under the leadership of Thomas Helwes. And Thomas Helwes was a dissenter, a separatist in England, and he got into a lot of trouble for being Baptist uh, because he had some radical ideas. And one of the radical ideas he had was that there should be a separation between church and state. And another radical idea was that there should be religious freedom and religious tolerance for all. And so he was not a friend of King James I. And so, in fact, Thomas Helwes was put into prison. And I think he eventually died in prison. So, historically speaking, the modern Baptist movement, at least the English-speaking Baptist, traces its roots back to that time, early 1600s. But as Baptists, we believe that the principles and the teachings that we hold actually go back to the New Testament. And so we would say that uh, the teachings and the beliefs we hold are consistent with the New Testament church after Pentecost as well. So there's some kind of roots of Baptist thought in history. Well, over the years, there have been a number of what we would call distinctives that when put together kind of frame the Baptist voice as being unique within the spectrum of Protestant churches. And these distinct distinctives have different names. Uh, they're numbered differently. Uh, some would say we have seven. Some would say we have nine. Maybe we have 11 typical Baptists. We can't agree. We'll form a committee to figure this all out at some point. Uh, but I'm just going to go over some of the very basic distinctives that kind of frame the Baptist voice for today. And I'm going to give some titles to these. So I'll group three distinctives under the title of authority, because authority is really important as we talk about Baptist distinctives. And then another three that I'm going to frame under the title autonomy, because autonomy and freedom is another important concept within Baptist distinctives. And then I've got two left over. I'm just going to put that under the title, Additional Teachings. And so let's walk through this together really quickly. And you'll see this isn't a deep theological exploration of these ideas. You can do that on your own time. I actually encourage you to explore that a little further, and maybe we'll have some conversations about it. But this is a broad stroke idea of the Baptist distinctives. Okay, first of all, under the topic of authority, Distinctive number one, the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Basically speaking, this is saying that Jesus is the head of the church, period. And I know that sounds obvious to some people, but it's an important distinctive. It basically says that no human figure, even on earth today, is the head of the church proper. So not the Pope, not the Queen of England, no human figure, it's, it's just Jesus. So the Lordship of Jesus states that Jesus is the true head of the church. That's an important distinctive. That's where authority is based in the Baptist church. Second important distinctive, the sufficiency of scripture. As Baptists, we're not against uh, written statements of faith or against creeds. We just don't place too much weight in them and they're certainly not above the scriptures. So the scriptures as revealed to us in the Old and New Testaments, that is sufficient for us in all matters of faith and practice. And so whenever we go to find out what we're meant to do, we go ultimately to the scriptures, not a written document, not a creed, not a statement from the church. The sufficiency of scripture is an important authority piece within Baptist distinctives. Okay, the third one. The priesthood of all believers. Now, I know we share this in common with a lot of Reformed churches, a lot of Protestant churches, but it's an important distinctive that part, forms part of the Baptist framework. This means that 
as a believer in Jesus, I am also counted as a priest, that I have authority and access to God, that because of the work of Jesus, I don't have to go through an intermediary. I don't have to go through a saint. I don't have to go through confession or to another person in order to gain access to God. But because of the work of Jesus, we are all priests together. And so we have access to God and we have responsibility to represent God to the world. And so those are three authority pieces I find within the Baptist distinctives. The Lordship of Jesus, the sufficiency of scripture, and the priesthood of all believers. Well, what about freedom? What about autonomy? Here's three distinctives that mark out our autonomy as Baptists. First of all, soul liberty. That means the, the right of each individual to choose for themselves whether to believe or not to believe and what to believe. That no individuals should be coerced into believing a certain principle or a certain ideal according to religious uh, um, instruction. Uh, there used to be a time when if you lived in a certain area, you were marked as Protestant or you're marked as Catholic and that's who you were. And Baptists came along and said, no, there should be a sense of soul liberty, the right of the individual to explore for themselves and choose for themselves what to believe and how to practice that. And Baptists, we would defend that not just for ourselves, but we defend that for others as well. So soul liberty is an important part of that autonomy piece. Here's another one, the separation of church and state. So as Baptists, we have no plans to rule Canada. That's not on our agenda. We don't have plans to, to take over government and to have a Baptist state. That's not the, the way that we work. We certainly support Baptists and Christians that are in politics, but we have no rule or right to govern the country as Baptists. We also want to make a distinction so that the state does not have the right to dictate what happens in worship within our churches. And so that's part of the separation of church and state that we want to defend and protect as Baptists. Again, not just for ourselves, but for others. Okay, third part of the autonomy piece is the local church autonomy. So this is a very interesting part of the Baptist distinctive. Every local congregation has the authority to appoint its own leaders, to call its own pastors, to form its own structures, to decide its own ministries, to own its own building and property. Uh, and so each small congregation is an autonomous unit. Now we're also free to associate with like-minded churches around or to disassociate from them. And so each local congregation is autonomous. Okay, so there's authority and autonomy. Authority, the Lordship of Jesus, sufficiency of scriptures, priesthood of all believers. And autonomy, soul liberty, the separation of church and state, and local church autonomy. Okay, two other things I'll put under additional, and uh, these are important as well. In the Baptist tradition, we only have two ordinances. Now, within other church structures, they have five or seven or more, what they call sacraments. A sacrament, literally speaking, is a means of grace. Ordinances, as Baptists talk about, are the things that were ordained by Jesus for the church to continue to practice in perpetuity. So there's only two things that we can really see that were really meant to practice as regular rituals within the church. One, baptism. And within the Baptist church, we baptize by immersion and we baptize those who are able to give a confession of their own faith before God and others. And so we call it believer's baptism. And in this church and most Baptist churches, we practice it by immersion. The word baptizo means to immerse. And so we fully immerse whenever we can. The other um, ordinance is the Lord's Supper. And the Lord's Supper is an act of remembrance as we gather around the bread and the juice. So that's typical in Baptist churches 
to have two ordinances. One last thing. We also have two offices. Now, this is typical in Baptist churches, but like I said, every Baptist congregation is autonomous, and so they form their own structures and own leadership patterns, and this church at Bonavista Baptist, we have our own patterns as well. But traditionally speaking, we don't have a whole hierarchy. We don't have bishops, and we don't have um, the, the Pope, or we don't have all the different hierarchy of church structure. We just have two offices, pastor and deacon. And that's normally how the church operates. Pastors are charged with the care of the congregation spiritually. Pastors are meant to give attention to the word of God and to prayer. And the deacons are meant to be the servants of the church. They're the ones that take care of a lot of the practical issues in the church. And so that's kind of how we're structured. So there's some distinctives. And you might say, well, I see that in other churches too. And absolutely, I think the Baptist voice um, has had such an impact on many congregations around the world that we see that in Alliance churches and Mennonite Brethren, even in Pentecostal churches, a lot of these distinctives. But put together, it still forms, I think, a unique voice within the church spectrum. And it's something that we can offer. So Baptist congregations are meant to be simple, local, radical, autonomous communities of believers shaped by the scriptures and subject only to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Well, in the next video next week, I'm going to take some of these principles and apply them to see just how does this work out practically in the regular life of the worshiping and witnessing community. So thanks for joining us today. Hope you found this helpful. Explore these things further and let's engage in a conversation together. Thanks for checking in.